Hi everyone, this is Adam. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Russell and Carey reading, which I just thought was wonderful. A, a Denina Ktuna, or Tanina Plantlor, rather, it should be Denina Plantlor. And I hope you found this interesting. I thought several points were interesting that I thought we could go over for a few minutes together. My goal is to keep this under 15 minutes, and so I'll cut the video there wherever I'm at. Um, but I saw several points of interest in this reading, including about... Um, sort of how traditionally uh, Denina kids in villages interacted with parents, which I thought had a lot of application to our modern life of sort of working from home and working through Zoom given the pandemic. Uh, I thought some of the notes on the foods people were eating were really interesting. Maybe that's just on my mind a lot because I started a diet today. Uh, and then also uh, this whole concept of sort of relating to non-human beings with respect, which I think is uh, so critical as we talk about sort of how to live in Alaska and how to thrive in Alaska. So hope you found it interesting. I, I certainly did. So here's a few thoughts of my own. Uh, first of all, I wanted to quickly mention if you didn't, uh, if you don't already do this, I suggest whenever you're reading an ethnography, uh, it always makes sense, at least to me, to go and check when it was first published, when it was first copyrighted. Or, um, that usually gives you, not always, but sometimes gives you an indication of when the actual research occurred, which I think matters because when we talk about uh, the findings of an ethnography, we're talking about sort of a moment in time. And the specific moment of time here is sort of the late 70s, early 80s when this research was taking place. It doesn't mean that a whole lot of this stuff isn't still true. It is, uh, but it's to suggest that we keep in mind that what we're reading about is what this researcher discovered in the specific communities uh, where she worked specifically in the 70s and 80s. A couple other things I wanted to note as we're reading through the foreword. The foreword makes a distinction, since this is a book about plant lore, about plant knowledge, between, quote, Denina, scientific, and English names. I, and then later on talking about whether or not the plant usages have been scientifically tested or verified. Um, I do want to point out, I get what the author is saying, and I think they're using that term scientific correctly. However, I do want to note that sometimes when people are writing about indigenous knowledge, they kind of make this sharp contrast between indigenous, in this case, Denina knowledge and quote unquote scientific knowledge. When what I think people are really meaning is a specific type of scientific knowledge, specifically scientific knowledge, um, a following a, a more formalized version of the a formalized version of the scientific method, specifically funded and done through institutions which historically have been founded. Uh, in colonial spaces. And so we're kind of talking more about quote unquote Western science, although I don't really like that term, especially because this is something that's worldwide. Uh, we're talking about sort of industrial science, right? Uh, late capitalism science. There's a lot of things we're talking about there. But that's not to suggest that the scientific method um, is solely a provenance of the West. And indeed, um, that's something that's been critiqued by a lot of scholars. So for example, uh, there's a great reading called Science for the West myth for the rest uh, by a guy named, I think it was James Scott. Anyways, he writes about specifically First Nations knowledge in Canada. I think he was working with Cree groups specifically about geese migration patterns. And he makes the point that there's this tendency uh, to speak about indigenous knowledge as sort of um, religious but not scientific and then to distinguish these sharply. But he points out the fact that knowledge of geese migrations very much had scientific bases to it where people had observed how geese were migrating over uh, centuries of history and that the fact that people also had a sacred understanding of it didn't discount or change the fact that this was scientific knowledge of geese behavior and that indeed the scientific knowledge and the sacred knowledge went hand in hand in this case. And so as he points out, you know, we're sort of making a false point to distinguish and say that, or to if we are implying that indigenous knowledge systems, traditional knowledge systems aren't themselves scientific in many cases. And so I thought that's, you know, a point worth remembering. Uh, the author points out when they did their field work and that they worked over 11 years and that they did informal interviews. I think that's always helpful when an ethnographer also actually always tells you their methods. Uh, I think that's become more common over the years. And I think that's good because uh, as with any scientific method, it's important that we understand both the possibilities and the limits, and especially with ethnography, it is so affected by who was doing the fieldwork, where they did the fieldwork, and when they did the fieldwork, who they spoke to, and the level of depth with which they were able to gain knowledge in the community. And so it's, you know, very helpful there. Um...
I thought this was interesting, this whole business by Petrov, who's, of course, writing in 1844, so it's a very long time ago, very early on in colonialism. But the idea uh, that indigenous peoples did not have medicinal knowledge of the plants in their area, which is, of course, just shockingly inaccurate, as um, our as uh, Russell Carey points out here, it's just totally inaccurate, right? This whole book is a collection of extensive plant medicinal knowledge among one specific group, the Denina. Uh, but, you know, this was something, this has often been the case, it reminds me a little bit of something that was written about um, Navajo religion. Uh, one of the earliest writers about Navajo religion basically said that Navajo people did not possess a religion per se, or not a very advanced one, which is of course ludicrous, you know, as two centuries of research have told us that Navajo sacred traditions are incredibly elaborate, significant, profound, philosophically moving. So sometimes there are these ideas that early explorers wrote down and that sometimes persisted or have persisted, which are just really inaccurate, um, really based on very little, based essentially on an inability to understand the native culture that then assumes that the native folks in question don't have a certain type of knowledge because uh, the settler did not ask the right questions or was not familiar enough with the language or otherwise wasn't familiar with that knowledge. It's really important to remember uh, when we think about some of the ways that kind of common sense, quote unquote, or assumptions or stereotypes about cultural groups today, the assumptions we make uh, that maybe somebody 200 years from now looks at and says, wow, you really didn't know what you were talking about. So a little note for intellectual humility, as it were. Um, the author distinguishes between inland, iliamna, outer inlet, and upper inlet, denina, people as kind of groups uh, with some cultural linguistic differences, despite all being Denina. I think that's really important that we always remember the diversity within Denina traditions, especially as we start saying, th seeing things later in the reading like the Denina, quote unquote, but remember that that's uh, several different villages of people who have a lot of commonalities, but also some distinctions and differences. So that's worth remembering. Uh, the author points out um, that plants were used for all sorts of things traditionally, uh, and to some degree still today, within Denina lifestyle for medicine and food, obviously, uh, but also for for firewood, so as the main form of heating, and for shelter, but also for boats, sleds, snowshoes, spears, bows, arrows, cooking utensils, dyes, incense, glue, chewing gum, um, all waterproofing materials. So plants, sort of thinking of plants as this robust resource, a far more robust resource than how um, I think of plants if I go into a forest, right? Even if I were to maybe do some very light foraging in terms of maybe finding some edible berries or something, that's very different than sort of being able to look at a forest and seeing, you know, dozens if not hundreds of uses. So trying to understand, this book is partly an attempt to try to understand some of that robust botanical or as we would say ethnobotanical knowledge. Um, I don't mean to overly critique this author. I think it's a really interesting and well-written book in a lot of ways, uh, but it's just a symptom of when you have to write about another group of people's culture. Um, the author several times says, the Denina people, their country, their plant system. It almost makes it sound like the Denina is sort of this homogenous entity, despite the author doing a really good job otherwise of pointing out the distinctions between different Denina groups and communities. So that's, you know, that's hard to get away from, but that's something to keep in mind. Since the 80s, we've had kind of what we sometimes call the reflexive turn in anthropology, where we've had to kind of think about when we say, you know, the New Air or um, the British, the Denina, what do we mean by the, right? All, all groups are diverse in one way or another. And so what do we mean by the, and how can we sort of, how are there commonalities, but how, also how are there diversities in any group that we're talking about? Okay, so skipping several pages along to this part about the Denina use of plants. Um, I thought it was very interesting pointing out that um, wild animal and fish were a very heavy part of the diet, but also wild fruit and underground plant parts. And if you kind of think about that, uh, what you would see is, you know, you'd see a diet, traditional diet, that's really well balanced in terms of a lot of different kinds of vitamins and macronutrients. So you have underground plant parts providing not only um, minerals and vitamins, but also uh, needed complex carbohydrates. You have wild fruit uh, providing simpler carbohydrates, sugars that are good for energy, but then also a variety of different kinds of vitamins that are good for you. And then um, you also have wild animals and fish, of course, providing a lot of proteins, omegas, a lot of different things. So we have a diet here that's really robust in terms of containing a lot of different things. Uh, it is the case uh, for some indigenous groups, and I cannot speak for the Denina on this point, but I can speak, for example, for the group I've worked with with the Navajo, where some, some scholars, some writers would say 
the uh, healthfulness of the diet really declined when colonialism came in as people shifted more towards things that they could buy from a store, at least partially, and those things tended to be heavily carbohydrate focused or uh, simple carbohydrate focused or otherwise sort of imbalanced towards one nutrient or another. Uh, so it's important to remember that many foraging groups had very diverse uh, diets that provided a lot of balance. The author makes a point about gender division of labor with men or with women primarily being in charge of obtaining and processing plants, men being in charge primarily of harvesting firewood, and yet at the same time notes that spouses would sometimes assist one another. So uh, this is a common pattern in a lot of traditional societies where you have a clear gender division of labor along male-female lines, but then you also have uh, some fluidity in the sense of people sometimes engaging to some degree in the other task. Uh, they talk about all female and all male work parties. Uh, the author is writing about this kind of as an economic thing to note, as a subsistence thing to note. But I would like to note it as also sort of an emotional thing to note, right? There's a reason that people divide, I think, labor by genders in many traditional societies, really in all traditional societies. And I don't, I think it primarily has to do with the need to divide labor on a practical, physical level. I think there's also a degree to which having a gender division of labor in many societies has allowed for certain types of solidarity, uh, such as work parties where people get to sort of have female solidarity, get to have male solidarity, get to spend time uh, with folks kind of going through a lot of the same life history types of experiences. So I think that's interesting. I also thought it was really interesting this point. Children also often accompany their parents or other close relatives and help according to their abilities. Imagine that, imagining actually bringing your children to your job and to whatever small degree they can help, or maybe a great degree, depending on the kid and the age, allowing your kid to help. We're all getting a bit of a practical experience in that right now, or at least a lot of us, those of us who are working from home uh, with bringing our children into our workplace, or rather bringing our workplace to our children. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, some people feel very embarrassed if their kid pops up on a Zoom camera while they're in a meeting or something. And certainly many of us find this extremely stressful, especially if you're the only parent for those kiddos or if both parents are working. Um, this could be a very stressful experience. Uh, uh, but that kind of highlights and raises an interesting thing about contemporary industrialized societies, which is the very particularly ones like our own, in which children are so much thought of as not a part of the workspace and as their own separate child realm, whereas you have many traditional hunting and gathering societies where children were very much part of the economic activity, again, not to the same degree as the adults, but they were part of it, they came along, they saw... Uh, mom and dad gathering and hunting and things of this nature, and they took part in it to some degree, and that was part of how they learned. So to some small degree, perhaps, um, although people might feel embarrassed by a kid popping up on a Zoom camera, at the same time, I think, uh, show patience and grace if that's your coworker, right? Because in reality, um, having children be around us while we're working is really the more, shall we say, I hate to use the word natural, uh, but the more default condition for humanity, that would have been a lot more common historically. It's kind of bizarre and modern that we have our children so much separate from our work. And there are reasons for that. But from a historical and anthropological perspective, it is rather unusual. Um, they talk about using wood that's uh, from windfalls. So windfalls, if you're not already familiar with this concept, uh, you can see this kind of close to my home because of uh, roads. But anyways, windfalls are where a gust of wind takes a bunch of trees and bowls them over and you can have a bit of a bowling pin phenomena. And that is something that just naturally occurs. So by using windfall wood, not only are you saving yourself labor, but you're sort of keying yourself in, as humans often do when we're being sustainable, you're keying yourself into an ecological process that's already happening. You're sort of using uh, some waste that nature's already producing or some product that nature's already producing rather than just going out and doing a clear cut or something. Um, they talk about the method of birch of uh, boiling water with hot rocks and birch bark, which they'll talk about. It, they've talked about it in the lecture before. Dr. Boris has, and which you'll hear some more about. Um, they talk about preservation with grease and oil, um, storing things in container or sometimes in animal stomachs or intestines or a birch bark basket, uh, as well as different kinds of underground cash pits, which Dr. Boris talks about in the lectures. I wanted to point out all of that just to suggest that, you know, there's very sophisticated and nuanced ways in which people were using technology to preserve their food. So we sometimes speak about technology as sort of a scale of less and more advanced, 
And I would like to have us break that a little bit and think of technology instead as, yes, there can be more or less advanced versions, parts that are simpler to figure out and harder to figure out, but there's also different pathways technology can go down, right? So a refrigerator is a more advanced version of a type of technology that uses electricity and artificially produces cold, but an underground catch pit or preserving things in oil and then putting them inside of an animal intestine is its own sort of sophisticated and advanced technology, just not one that uses electricity. Uh, the final point I wanted to make, and here I'm at 15 minutes, but I'm going to uh, break my word a little bit here and go to 18 minutes, is a whole lot of stuff about, in this denying of beliefs, I really like this section, and all these different thoughts about respect of animals, or sorry, respect of plants, such as addressing the plant in a respectful way, avoiding wasting the plant, um, leaving a small gift for plants in certain contexts, such as in mountains, all of this, and that the idea that depending on a person's behavior, plants could help or harm people, that some people could communicate with plants, and we'll actually get a lot more into that in the next section on denying a traditional spirituality. All of this, though, suggests a view of plants, a view of life, a view of nature, where we might think of plants as, and as well as other spirits associated with plants, as beings in a way that perhaps many of us in contemporary society don't often think of plants. Some of us do and some of us don't. Um, I try to be mindful of plants in this way. I try to, for example, talk to trees occasionally. Uh, but for many folks, it becomes very easy not to speak. So yeah, all of this implies and assumes and rests upon an idea of plants and other non-human beings as having a spirituality, having a personhood in some regards, that they even use the phrase plant people, or rather tree people, um, a sentience, a personhood, an autonomy, um, a relationship to human beings that's more than simply a resource. Yes, a resource, but other things as well, also a being to be related to. And I think when we look at this list of traditional prohibitions that it talks about, what anthropologists would sometimes call taboos, uh, kind of old-school anthropology, these rules, these regulations about these teachings about how to relate to plants, um, when you look at them in isolation, they might seem like interesting, but you might not see how it feeds into a broader worldview. But if you keep in mind this idea of sort of plants as beings with their own spirits, with their own entityhood, then some of these make specific regulations, as is often the case with religion, some of the specific practices make a lot more sense, a lot more meaningful, a lot more depth to them when we consider them in part of a bigger uh, cosmological context. So for example, the idea that if edible plants are not gathered and used, there will be fewer the following year. Um, if they aren't gathered over a number of years, they'll disappear. That implies a sort of relationality uh, where spirits are perceiving how these plants are being used and responding accordingly. Um, so, you know, all of this is very interesting. I hope you found it interesting, and I thank you for your time.